So hi again, everybody. Just a reminder again about the recording, uh, and I will be sharing uh, my screen. I'm Dr. Ramsey Asfor. Uh, most of you know me. I've been uh, president of CAPSID along with uh, Dr. Dost Sarpel, who's on the line and will be contributing uh, any questions, and Marianne, who's on the line by phone. And uh, we're here to answer your questions. Whether it's now offline, you can always contact us privately. Uh, happy to answer one-on-one -on -one questions about the vaccine and uh, anything else uh, COVID or infection uh, related. So, uh, and uh, let's uh, let's go on with a little bit of background from uh, you know COVID where we are. And uh, this is the Johns Hopkins uh, COVID tracker website. Uh, very informative. You can see there's been five billion vaccine doses administered, all right? Uh, five billion, that's just an incredible uh, number. And uh, most of those, of course, are in uh, North America and Europe and uh, starting to get more vaccines in New Zealand and Australia. But uh, unfortunately, not as many, as some in China and Russia, but more, and, and of course, Japan's ramping up now too, but uh, most of this is in the West. And so you can see that uh, perhaps uh, cases in other countries are going to be uh, problematic as well because they haven't had access to the vaccine. And now we have some people with third doses as well, as I'm sure you've heard, and 216 million cases. But I just want to point this number out. 5 billion uh, vaccine doses administered. So all the side effects, uh, people say it's not been around that long. The vaccine has not been around that long. I completely agree. However, uh, we have 5 billion doses of vaccines, different ones, of course, but that's a tremendous number of vaccines. That's a tremendous amount of data and that's tremendous safety and reassurance uh, just in that number. That's an unfathomable number, you know, huge uh, number. I, I always like to show you what's going on. Co uh, Hopkins has a great summary. Oops, just play that for you real quick. So that's just a brief uh, update, and I won't belabor that point, but I want I want everybody to look at Florida. Total cases in Florida, you can see that the, the slope is increasing. Uh, and if you look at the daily new cases uh, in Florida, it's just much higher than it has been at the previous peak, which is scary. And that's the state where the governor uh, disallowed mask mandates. They've actually done a decent job at vaccinating people and Doing, uh, you know, doing more in that respect, but it's it's a problem. California, we're doing, you know, the, our slope is not uh, as high. The, the rate of increase is not as high. Daily new cases is uh, much lower than the peak. You did see some activity in Southern California, but uh, there is, there certainly is, and there are uh, breakthrough infections, and we'll talk about that too. I also want to show you that. You know, come on, we've got to do better than Uruguay uh, and China and the UK and, and France in terms of uh, COVID vaccine doses administered per 100 people. And now in the US, this is already including third doses, booster doses for uh, elderly or immunocompromised. And, uh, you know, we're still just barely above uh, Turkey and, and other uh, countries. We should be leading the pack uh, and we're not, which is why uh, there's been 
such an increase in cases in, in the US and hospitalizations in many areas. So daily new COVID cases confirmed per million people. France is going down, uh, Germany. The reason the UK is going up is interesting uh, because uh, they have decided to live with COVID in a sense and just to have their, uh, they call them football games, we call them soccer games, to have them uh, in stadiums where you have you know, 80,000 people or 60,000 people in the stadium and just to, to live life. There's been some uh, interesting decisions around that, but their vaccination rate again is higher than ours. So the level of sickness or hospitalizations from these infections is probably gonna be a lot lower than in the US. So how to manage the Delta wave? Well, in Iceland, look what people did. They got vaccinated and the Delta wave has significantly decreased. This is from Dr. Eric Topol's uh, Twitter feed, which is very interesting. He posts uh, multiple COVID related messages every day uh, that are science-based and, and quite interesting. So, uh, you know, many older Americans still aren't vaccinated. I was saying that rates in the UK are higher than, and certainly uh, Scotland is very high uh, in terms of vac vaccine protection. Red is no vaccine and, uh, or, or little vaccine and uh, yellow is uh, light. The lighter the color, the more uh, vaccinations. And, and you can see California is pretty highly vaccinated. Uh, Florida, not terrible, but again, mask mandates were outlawed in Florida and Texas, although that was recently apparently turned over uh, by a judge in Florida. So we'll see how that plays out. Indoor masking, very important. Uh, so increasing uh, vaccination rates are in states now that previously had low rates because of the COVID, uh, uh, the Delta wave. Uh, we're seeing the, a lot of states, even California, seeing a surge in uh, new vaccinations uh, recently, which is very encouraging. Uh, certainly we have a lot of mandates in California now, and uh, that's a lot of the, uh, the questions here. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot going on with COVID uh, up, updates uh, in, in uh, and certainly the, the Florida surge, what went wrong. So even as a large state that emphasized vaccinations and combating the coronavirus can be crushed by the Delta variant when no other measures are put in place. So, uh, you know, I'm supposed to be talking about vaccinations and I am, but I just wanna also continually emphasize the importance of indoor masking. Uh, that, that, is, that is critical. Um, and this for some reason didn't load, but uh, we'll try to load it again. But this is uh, talking about the, the death, this is a Fox News website talking about the death of uh, Phil Valentine uh, who, uh, you know, he was a proponent of uh, not getting a vaccine. And uh, that's been a, uh, obviously an, an issue in, in the conservative media as a conservative radio talk show host. And then he got COVID. Then he said, to, he said, I apologize, everybody, please get your vaccines. And then he died of COVID, sadly. So uh, it's, it's a, uh, Terrible story, but you know even people who had once rejected vaccinations are saying, "Hey, this is this is serious stuff." Uh, one thing to emphasize is scientific uncertainty. So, what is going on with the changing mandates? Do you need a booster dose? Do you need uh, one dose? Do you need uh, masking? Why did CDC say mask and no mask and uh, and then mask again? So. You know, I think our public health, I used to work at World Health Organization and I, I have this public health hat that I like to wear from time to time. Uh, the interesting, uh, uh, quite, it's, it's been an interesting uh, uh, response and it's, uh, it's hard to know what to do. And one thing is to communicate that it's hard for a scientific body or a public health agency to know what they should recommend. And I don't think we've been very good at communicating that uh, doubt, that uncertainty, the scientific uncertainty that necessarily exists. An example is aspirin. There's still some scientific uncertainty on, is there really a, 
of what, what's the benefit of aspirin versus the risk of aspirin, which could be bleeding, for example. And I mean, even with that question, there's still data coming out. So uh, that's why I want to go back to the five uh, billion doses of vaccine administered. That's an incredible number of vaccine doses. And uh, you know, part of it is perhaps coercion. We don't like to do that in China. They will hold you responsible for transmitting COVID in undetermined ways if you are unvaccinated. And so that's probably scared some people into vaccination. The, the others, we just don't understand everything about coronaviruses. So yesterday I was speaking to uh, a cousin of mine who uh, distributes animal, uh, he's an animal pharmacist and he has a, he distributes uh, vaccines for animals. Uh, that's his, his job. And uh, we, you know, he pulled up uh, this article, we discussed this article yesterday, it came out in 2020. And it's very interesting. It's a discussion about coronaviruses in animals. And his, uh, one of his major lines of businesses is uh, chicken vaccines. And so chickens live, uh, this is news to me, I didn't, I never thought about it that much, but they live about two years before they're, you know, eaten uh, or uh, no longer laying enough eggs, et cetera. And they get uh, something called infectious bronchitis. And they, uh, they have, uh, they live in close quarters in, in uh, many cases. And even when they don't, they're vaccinated and they have to be vaccinated multiple times uh, during their two year lifespan uh, with different vaccines to, pro to provide a robust response. There isn't one vaccine that will do it for poultry for their lives. So they, they get multiple vaccines of different sorts. And there's, uh, you know, all of the coronaviruses that are licensed in, uh, in the US. And if you look at, uh, there's one, uh, I guess one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, or, or so different uh, infectious bronchitis vaccines for chicken. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, so taking that knowledge, applying it to what we know about COVID, is that COVID's not going away. We're going to have to learn to live with it. And vaccination is a key part of living with it uh, because we're taking some serious risks when we don't get vaccinated in terms of uh, our own health and safety. So, uh, you know, how do these vaccines work? One of the big questions I get or concerns I hear is that, will this be incorporated in your DNA? And the answer is absolutely not. Uh, there's been lots of rumors spread, uh, including uh, will you become a 5G wireless transmitter or Bill Gates' microchip? Or yeah, I don't know how these things start. It's, it's quite uh, interesting uh, and, and, and upsetting. The, uh, but basically the mRNA vaccine, so specifically the Pfizer and Moderna are, uh, they, they take the genetic sequence that's required to produce the spike protein that's on the, co on, on the viral particle. And it's a genetic sequence of a few letters. And they, uh, they artificially produce that RNA in the lab, just the RNA that codes this, okay? Not the whole virus. So it's not even using the whole virus. It's using um, it's gen genetic, it's synthesizing this artificially in a lab. And then what you do is the RNA vaccines have actually been around for a while in the lab setting. And uh, we're getting to, you know, they're being used uh, in uh, clinical trials uh, for uh, Zika and uh, Ebola and uh, other illnesses. Even there's been some people work on flu uh, with RNA vaccines, but they hadn't been trialed yet in humans. So. Uh, the, the hard part was making this lipid, lipid means fat, a fatty particle that would keep this RNA stable because it's very unstable. It degrades quickly, uh, stable enough to get taken up by a cell. And so finally that problem was solved. So now we have this uh, RNA molecule that can get taken up by a cell and injected into uh, a, uh, 
well, it, the, it, it's injected into human uh, as this lipid particle, and then the cells take it up and they start producing some antibody. And uh, sorry, they start producing the antigen here, the spike protein on the cell, and then your body sees that and says, wait, that doesn't belong in a human, let me make an antibody to it. And that's how you get a response. Now, the key is that one way to think about it, people say, well, what if this persists forever? Well, it doesn't, because if it did persist forever, you wouldn't need a booster dose. You wouldn't need a second dose, but you need a second dose because it doesn't last that long. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. You need a booster dose because this effect lasts just a matter of days and, and uh, really not, not long enough to produce a durable response. So you need two doses. And now we're learning you might need a booster dose in the future. So uh, it does not go into the nucleus. This is the nucleus. There's no mechanism to get this genetic material into the human nucleus. It just won't happen. Other viruses like HIV, they have a special mechanism where HIV will get this into the nucleus. It has a couple of enzymes in it that take the RNA, make a copy into DNA and your cells in the nucleus have DNA and uh, it, you know, it needs two separate enzymes, it comes with it. That's why that virus we, we can't get rid of, but coronavirus we can get rid of. It doesn't go into the nucleus. So either on its own or uh, uh, with this. So there's a bunch of FAQs on websites and uh, in the interest of time, I will uh, just uh, refer you, but uh, this is you know, very uh, interesting. And so can the mRNA contained in the vaccine remain in the DNA of human cells? And the answer is because it is RNA, it cannot integrate into the DNA of the vaccinated cells. All right, so it, it, uh, it cannot happen. Uh, one thing we talk about in uh, pregnancy, so a lot of women are afraid to get uh, vaccinated when they're pregnant, but uh, just like influenza and like the swine flu, we had many pregnant women dying of flu, and I've had pregnant women die of COVID-19. Uh, and sometimes the baby survives and sometimes it doesn't. That's, that's very concerning. So uh, this study shows that uh, there's a, a consistent association between pregnant individuals with COVID-19 diagnoses and higher rates of adverse outcomes, including maternal mortality, meaning sickness, preeclampsia, a condition that's quite dangerous around the time of delivery, and preterm birth compared with pregnant individuals without COVID-19. So mortality, death, and illness is higher with, in, in pregnancy. So the uh, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology uh, has come out recommending uh, COVID vaccination before you get pregnant, when you're pregnant, or after you're pregnant, uh, at any time that you can possibly get it, uh, get it. If you're not, if you, if you're unvaccinated and you're pregnant, you should get it. If you're unvaccinated, if you just delivered, you should get it. And if you're unvaccinated and thinking about pregnancy, you should get it. And the bottom line is you should just get the vaccine because your choice is to get, now with Delta, especially being so infectious, your choice is to get COVID or get the vaccine. And uh, we're learning that there's a lot of young people uh, in hospitals. So this is a very interesting letter written by Dan Rather uh, of CBS News fame, uh, talking about apologizing to healthcare workers for not getting vaccinated. And it's very interesting. And we, uh, you know, we've got a lot of uh, misinformation and he's addressing that. It's a very good read if you have the time. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, Dr. Shane, uh, uh, I'll get his last name in a second. Uh, he's a virologist at UC San Diego. This is UCSF's COVID Grand Rounds. And I just wanted to show this slide uh, that he presented that's very interesting that you can see immunity here from uh, uh, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines uh, lasting a fairly long time uh, after vaccination. And uh, part of the issue is uh, that we get a, uh, I don't have that slide up, but a uh, memory response. 
So when you get vaccinated, you don't just get antibodies, and, and this is this is antibody response. You get memory CD4, memory T cells, and memory B cells, and you get antibodies. So you get one, two, three, four types of protection, many more actually, but uh, CD8 memory, CD4 memory, uh, so two types of T cell memory cells, one type of B cell memory cell, and you get antibodies. So the antibodies may fall over time, but the reason we're seeing that people with COVID who, sorry, people with, uh, that are fully vaccinated that get COVID, they're not getting very sick because they have not just antibody response, but these other three types of responses. But the, per perhaps the reason they're getting some symptoms is because the antibody response is falling, but they still have a CD4, uh, they still have a memory response, and that memory response keeps them out of the hospital, it keeps them from getting severely ill. Okay, that, that's another Im important concept. Um, so here's the decline. Uh, uh, so this is uh, Carlos Del Rio, Dr. Del Rio, uh, very well known and uh, genius, if you will, uh, infectious disease expert. The decline in mRNA Pfizer vaccine protection against Delta reported from Israel does not impact hospitalizations or death. So in Israel, they're giving everybody now, uh, I believe, a third dose. However, uh, they're getting more infections. I showed you their curve was going up, but they have significant protection that's lasting. Okay, they have lasting significant protection because it's keeping them out of the hospital. That's a, a very uh, important concept uh, to, to realize. Um, there's a lot, a lot to show you here. Uh, this slide is interesting. Uh, showing uh, COVID-19 among fully vaccinated people in Georgia. This circle should be a lot smaller, but uh, you know uh, some that tested positive, very few hospitalized and very few deaths in COVID-19. And some of those deaths are in people who died with COVID. They tested, they came in to the hospital with uh, a heart attack and they happened to test positive for COVID or they came in with a GI bleed and they happened to test positive for COVID. They didn't die from COVID. Uh, I've talked about Pfizer and Moderna, I haven't talked about Janssen or the J&J &J vaccine, but that also provides a uh, pretty durable response. And we're actually seeing that perhaps there's some equivocal studies, but it does seem like the response is rather long lasting from the J&J &J shot, but they'll probably give a booster as well. Uh, so that's another uh, shot. So, uh, you know, where we are seeing, and we need to be honest, as, as I was mentioning, public health authorities should be communicating that we're going to see a lot of breakthrough uh, infections. And so uh, we, we do know that the effectiveness of the mRNA vaccines in preventing infection has decreased. But, uh, and, and, the, and the infectiousness is certainly there. So even if you were planning on uh, surrounding you're not getting vaccinated yourself and surrounding yourself with vaccinated people, uh, you know, it's still, those vaccinated people can still transmit uh, in many cases. And so uh, they transmit less, most likely, and the duration of transmission is less, but you're not protected by, get, by surrounding yourself with, you're not as protected as you think by surrounding yourself with vaccinated people. Uh, so you can't rely on the goodwill of others to protect yourself anymore. Uh, and a you know, large-scale study of antibody titer decay following the Pfizer vaccine uh, showed that uh, you know they have different uh, you know they have higher initial levels but a much faster decrease. So if you've had COVID, your rate of decrease in antibodies is a lot lower than that if you had uh, uh, you know if if you didn't. But so you need boosters if you haven't had COVID. And it's certainly much better to not uh, have had COVID. And to reiterate here, in the words of Dr. Topol, uh, prior to Delta, mRNA vaccines had well over 90% effectiveness versus infections, uh, with Delta that has dropped to around 50%. So uh, we're seeing that uh, Delta is less effective at preventing infection, but still highly effective at preventing uh, uh, severe illness. Okay, so uh, the the uh, this is an interesting study 
showing, this is from MMWR, let me just show you the, the headline, uh, the CDC's publication, SARS-CoV-2 infections, COVID infections and hospitalizations by vaccine status, May through July 25, so through the end of July. And if we go scroll down to the figure here, we see that uh, infection and hospitalization rates, these are infection rates, okay? Unvaccinated getting infected at a much higher rate than vaccinated. So vaccine still seems to have significant protection against infection, but not as much as before. But look at this data, hospitalization, almost nil in, uh, here, but very, you know, very high in unvaccinated. So almost nil in the unvaccinated. Keep that in mind, vaccines save lives. And uh, this study was, uh, uh, is for healthcare workers in eight locations in the US. And uh, it also suggested that the vaccines were very helpful in preventing death from COVID, an outcome that we, uh, we wanna see. So I'll just have that there for your, your reference. Uh, there's a lot of myths versus fact. Uh, you know, COVID can affect women's fertility. It does not. There's no uh, evidence to, to suggest that. Uh, certainly, you can get a reaction to the vaccine. And uh, we do know that uh, there's been very few uh, serious reactions, uh, but, uh, but some people will get flu-like symptoms, uh, fatigue, et cetera. Some people more so after the second dose than the first. And, uh, you know, these vaccines have been, uh, you know, created using technology that was already existing. In fact, uh, the founder of uh, uh, BioNTech, which is the German company that made the vaccine that we call the Pfizer vaccine, they partnered with Pfizer to mass produce it. The, the uh, a very interesting story, the, the owner of the company and his wife, I think uh, co-owners or founders, I think the, the, the man is the richest man now in, in Germany or, or had been already. So he's already started up three or four companies. So he was kind of doing this for fun. He was developing an mRNA vaccine. He's already the richest person. And he's already working in mRNA technology. And then he said, well, he learned, learned about COVID and same with the team at Moderna early in uh, January. And you know, this guy for his, you know, he got married to his wife and what did they do on their wedding day? They both rode their bicycles because he doesn't own a car uh, from his apartment in Frankfurt to his lab. And uh, he, he was working on, uh, you know, and, and, and the lab, they went to the lab. So he's a, a, a super smart, a nerdy person, if you will, uh, that uh, has a very interesting story. So he, you know, wasn't doing this for the money. He already, uh, you know, was, was super wealthy and, and really seems to not really care about uh, personal wealth and, you know, really working on getting, uh, he, he worked quickly with his team at their own expense initially to get this uh, technology up and running to serve humanity. I, I think it's a laudable goal. There's a lot of people talking about religious exemptions from the COVID vaccine. Uh, where do different religions stand on this? Well, the Catholic, you know, these are acellular, uh, the Catholic church, the Pope is in favor of vaccination. Uh, most religions are in favor of vaccination. So, uh, so most of them stand in favor, uh, which, which is good. Uh, again, more issues in Florida. And uh, I can keep going, but I want to see before I do if there's any questions and if Dr. Sarpel maybe also has uh, a few other things to add to what I have, might have said already. Yeah, sure. Uh, can you hear me OK? Yes. All right. So. I just wanted to add, I mean, we mentioned a lot about um, uh, with Delta, the infection rates have gone up, um, you know, or the vaccine is 50% effective against infection. But I just want to reiterate and point out that the job of a vaccine is not to prevent the, an infection, right? So the job of a vaccine is to prevent disease. That's what vaccines have always been about. Uh, the vast majority of vaccines are not what we call sterilizing vaccines. They're just 
to get the vaccine to prevent the disease, such as polio. I mean, and in the past, we just didn't go around testing, uh, doing molecular tests, you know, PCR tests on people who've gotten, let's say, the chickenpox vaccine, the polio vaccine, name a vaccine. We didn't just go around swabbing hundreds of thousands of people like we are with COVID. So, you know, what you need to keep in mind is uh, that the vaccine still prevents severe disease from COVID with the Delta variant and still prevents hospitalization and death. And that is the biggest thing to keep in mind. That's one. And then the other thing I wanted to add that I, you know, I'm sure some people in this um, Zoom are worried about are the side effects of the vaccine. You know, you may have read about um, myocarditis or heart inflammation, particularly among young male adults. Uh, with the mRNA vaccines, um, you may have read about, you know, the very rare disorder of uh, venous thrombus in the brain uh, with the Johnson and Johnson and um, Guillain-Barre is another one, demyelinating disease. Um, so you may have read about these or heard about these, but one thing you need to keep in mind. So let's just take the heart inflammation and myocarditis. So. Does that happen with the vaccine or can that happen with the vaccine? Yes, right? But what is the rate? It's like one in 100,000. We're talking 0.001% at most. It's probably even less than that, right? If your kid got COVID, what is the chance of that happening? That's like one in 20, right? So you got to think about that in that way. You get COVID, your risk of getting heart inflammation from it, a stroke from it, Guillain-Barre from it is significantly higher, like logarithmically higher than getting it from the vaccine. So that's what you got to compare it to. It's like, what are the chances of this happening if I get COVID? Okay, and what are the chances of it happening with the vaccine? The vaccine, I mean, it's ridiculously rare. Um, and Dr. Asfor pointed out all the doses that have been um, given throughout the world. Um, so it's very, very rare for these side effects to happen. And it's way more common for them to happen with uh, COVID in and of itself. So that's the other thing uh, to keep in mind. And I just wanted to point that out. Great. Uh, I think that's, that's, uh, that's great. You guys can all type in questions in the chat box if you like. I'll, I wanted to show this because a lot of people, uh, you know, said that, well, I'm an adult, I'm healthy, uh, I'm, I'm not at risk for severe COVID. But keep in mind that at least 80% of people, even with mild COVID, uh, were, you know, have at least one sy symptom, and many more. So I, in my outpatient practice, I see people with long COVID, and, and quite a few. And this is a problem that, you know, if your lungs get, you know, you get a little pneumonia, your lungs, every hit they take, they get a little bit more uh, fibrotic, a little bit more damaged. And if you end up in the hospital with COVID, you're going to get lung issues uh, and perhaps long-term. Uh, agesia means taste. Uh, and, you know, but 58% fatigue, 44% headache. There's been students, uh, you know, you know school-age students, who can't concentrate anymore. They don't remember what they were studying an hour before, or did they take that test? Did they not? There's been a lot of, of issues and a lot of long-term cognitive. Look at all, all these on the right-hand side here uh, are, are cognitive or mental uh, uh, brain effects of COVID. So uh, this is a major, major problem. And so the vaccines, in preventing you from getting uh, COVID will prevent you from getting long COVID. So there's there's plenty of good reasons to to do that. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, of data about the long-term effects of COVID. We do need to uh, respect that. I wanted to show this, um, again, another post from Dr. Topol. It took over three decades for mRNA vaccines to be developed uh, so that people have been thinking about these things, working on them for 30 years, and now their potential against COVID variants and other pathogens is limitless. So are we gonna hear about uh, 
more COVID, uh, different COVID vaccines? Are they going to change the sequence in the mRNA vaccines at some point? Yes, uh, they are. Are there going to be new vaccines? Yes. Are you going to have to take a different vaccine at some point in the future? Most likely. Will there be oral therapies for COVID? My veterinary, uh, my cousin who is in veterinary medicine, as, as I mentioned, he doubts it, he says, because uh, they haven't been able to come up with that for uh, for animals, for livestock yet. So uh, certainly there's more interest and focus in doing it for humans. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of newer medications, protease inhibitors, other promising technologies for oral treatments. And once we have an oral treatment, perhaps we will have a, uh, a better uh, way of controlling this because if you have something like Tamiflu, as you all know, in a nursing home, when there's one patient with Tamiflu, sorry, when one patient with influenza and another with symptoms, that's an outbreak. And then we prophylax the whole building. And we, when we don't, it's to our peril because it's, it spreads quickly. So perhaps we can do that with uh, uh, COVID treatment. That would be encouraging. Uh, you know, here's the timeline of the development of mRNA vaccines. It's very quick uh, for, for, for COVID. So from uh, December 1st of 2019 till December 11th of 2020, uh, you know, that's the phase 1A vaccination. It began. So basically a year. Incredible that we can do that. And we have this tool to get the pandemic under control, yet it's underutilized. And, uh, you know, we, 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 we uh, make that decision not to get vaccinated uh, at, at our uh, peril. So uh, I just want to reiterate, you know, that now that the slide is up, the reason we were able to do it within a year is as you pointed out, the mRNA technology was being worked on. So uh, there's been tremendous uh, advances in technology and in science over the last uh, decade or so that has allowed us to use this mRNA technology as well as some other more standard uh, technologies and develop this vaccine uh, in a year. Like no steps were skipped. The other thing that uh, got it approved so quickly besides there being you know a pandemic and m hundreds of millions of people with the virus throughout the world we were able to by we i mean the scientific community were able to recruit patients incredibly fast right so usually with vaccine studies it takes a long time to recruit enough people um, that was not the case for covid19 and uh, the way the studies were designed were sort of multi-layered to try to get the vaccine, to get all the study points done. So, you know, they were having phase 1A, phase 1B trials at the same time as phase 2A and, you know, phase 3 and et cetera, et cetera. So they were layered on top of each other uh, because there, there was enough funding, there was enough patients. Um, and that's why they were able to meet all these guidelines in a year. Whereas if you go back to, let's say, the 90s, when chickenpox vaccine came out, you know, uh, the technology is, you know, obviously not as good. It took longer to recruit people. Once they finished one phase one trial, then they went to the next phase just because it took a long time to each at each phase to recruit the people. So um, that is one of the reasons or actually there are multiple reasons uh, why uh, this was developed um, within a year. So I don't want people to think, oh, shortcuts were taking and things like that, because that's uh, definitely uh, not the case. And, and remember that uh, now we have more than uh, 5 billion doses of vaccines administered uh, throughout the world. So in the US, uh, certainly hundreds of millions, uh, you know, more than 100 million doses of uh, these vaccines have been administered, of the mRNA vaccines, it's incredible. It really is incredible. Somebody's asking, now that Pfizer has received FDA approval, there are rumors about a 14-day period in which they must submit their final product. Uh, will this new vaccine be different than what was previously under the EUA? No, the vaccine will be the same as under the EUA. If they wanted to change that sequence to cover Delta better, they'll have to uh, study it and submit for ask for a new authorization. So this e this authorization is just for this sequence. Uh, 
the same vaccine that uh, was first injected in people uh, outside of clinical trials in, in phase 1A on December 11, 2019. Uh, uh, are there any other questions or concerns about uh, the vaccines? I've tried to cover most of the concerns that I've heard. Uh, are, are there uh, are there any that uh, you've heard, Dr. Sarpel or Marianne or Edwin or Anlin or anybody, Amelia, anybody else uh, on the call? Kendra? Um, no, I mean, I think you hit up uh, most of the concerns people have, mainly the side effects and a lot of the other stuff. Um, and then the other thing, you know, I would reiterate um, is right and remember not everyone right now is eligible for the vaccine hopefully you know kids will be uh, eligible um, in the fall late fall it's looking like so hopefully that will happen um, and uh, we do know there's mounting evidence that people uh, who have been vaccinated let's say they they do get infected there's mounting evidence that they pose uh, less of a risk of transmission. A recent study came out a week or two weeks ago that showed that uh, household transmission uh, of COVID-19 uh, decreased by 70% uh, if a person was vaccinated. So, you know, it's something else to keep in mind. You may live with people who can't get the vaccine for, you know, either they're not old enough or there might be other reasons. So. Uh, you know, it's not just about, you know, you, it's about protecting your loved ones and, and, and people around you, as well as, you know, uh, your, the society as a whole. But I mean, you may be living with people that can't get vaccinated. And if you're around people with COVID, you're at risk of getting infected. If you're vaccinated, the chance of you bringing that home uh, is reduced uh, a significant amount. So that shouldn't be lost on people too. So that's another reason uh, to get vaccinated is, not, is yes, you're protecting yourself, but at the same time, you're protecting those around you. You're muted, Ramsey. One of the questions I've been getting quite a bit is, uh, how do uh, or why do the um, viruses mutate? And uh, to answer that question, I can, I can give a long-winded explanation. However, uh, I, I can also just show this, uh, this video here uh, that uh, is, uh, is quite informative. Uh, so imagine a bike lock, but each wheel has four options. A, C, G, or U. Now imagine the lock has 30,000 wheels. That's the entire genome sequence of the virus. Each time the virus spreads, it copies this sequence. So C, G, U. But every now and then, as it copies, wheels in the sequence can split. Most of the time, these tiny variations don't alter how the virus works. Sometimes the variations make combos that don't work. This makes the virus a little bit weaker and these strains tend to die out. And sometimes the variations can make the virus a tiny bit stronger, better at transmitting or more resistant to the immune system. These strains can thrive. The good news is that current COVID vaccines are designed so that in most cases, they will work against new variants. And researchers are working on ways to alter the composition of vaccines to cover possible new variants. So that's being worked on, as I mentioned, but uh, now, uh, you know- Just to get to that, sorry, just to get to that. Um, so this is very common with RNA viruses. Um, so hepatitis C is an RNA virus, HIV, um, and they all, they're, they're what's called variants uh, uh, um, uh, with the hepatitis C and HIV as well. So this is not you know, limited to COVID-19. This is just what happens. It's a natural 
uh, evolution of RNA viruses. So that's why they mutate. Um, and if you're putting uh, selective pressure on them with some people vaccinating, some not, then you may be uh, causing them to mutate maybe a little bit quicker or picking up mutations, I should say, that help uh, make them transmit better. So, uh, but the uh, variations are pretty common. Uh, I did see a question about lactating women. Uh, the vaccine is is fine in pregnancy, as Dr. Esper pointed out, it's fine in lactating women. And it actually may have the added benefit that if you develop antibodies, you may be able to um, you know, transmit those antibodies uh, that would offer some protection um, you know, for your baby, but uh, it's totally safe. Uh, um, and there's been no adverse reactions uh, noted with the vaccine in, in, in women who may be breastfeeding. And then here are a lot of, uh, the, this is the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology FAQ section on COVID and should breastfeeding women get a COVID vaccine? Yes, they should. There's no need to stop breastfeeding if you want to get a vaccine. When you get vaccinated, the antibodies made by your body may be passed through breast milk and may help your, protect your child from the virus. And they are, we are seeing an uptick in pediatric uh, hospitalizations and, out, and, and, and scary outcomes in children with COVID. So we need to do, and we, and we know that children under 12 cannot get the vaccine in the US uh, and so we do need to try to protect them as much as we can by getting vaccinated ourselves. So that's that's a major uh, a major issue. So uh, if there's no other questions, and hopefully we've answered uh, most of your questions, and uh, we are available again please feel free to reach out to any one of the CAPSID team members to get your questions addressed and answered. And we will send out a link to this recording uh, shortly and uh, so that those who missed it, you can all share it with your teams and your staff. And remember, talking to people uh, who refuse vaccinations in a supportive, kind, non-argumentative manner, using language such as uh, you know, to, to try to understand what, what their concerns are without telling them they're wrong uh, is very helpful. So, you know, that communication piece with the, the staff member uh, is, is really, uh, really important. And there's just been so much misinformation out there uh, that about vaccines, about COVID, etc. cetera. Uh, now the severity of the Delta variant is really causing a lot of people even who have been anti-vaxxers or uh, COVID deniers to come around and say, hey, we got to take this more seriously. So I hope you all take it seriously. And uh, again, please reach out to us with any questions. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Asper. Thank Welcome. you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.